Great Britain declared war on Germany August 4, 1914, in defense of Belgian neutrality. All over England, young men rushed to enlist. One such man, whose name is lost to history, was refused service. Recruits in the British Army were required to be at least 5 foot, 3 inches, or 160 centimeters tall. The man, a miner from Durham, was 5 foot 2. Enraged, she had walked from recruiting office to recruiting office, eventually covering 150 miles, starting in Durham and ending in Birkenhead. But every recruiter had refused him due to his height. Refused one more time at Birkenhead, he finally lost his temper, threw down his coat, and offered to fight any man who wanted to prove that the one inch mattered. As the Member of Parliament representing Birkenhead explained to the War Office, the man raged and swore until the recruiting sergeant, with great difficulty, got him out of the office. While the story is somewhat lost in legend, it could not have been far off of fact. Although it was not uncommon for recruiters to fudge on enlistment requirements, there are plenty of stories of men who did not meet the height fate requirement facing ridicule as well as refusal. Coal miner James Robertson, one inch below the requirement, wasn't even allowed inside the London Scottish headquarters in order to enlist. He recalled being told, to get in, there'd have to be two of you. England had, at least, many thousands of men who were willing to serve and otherwise physically fit but below the height requirements. For some, their stature was the result of poor nutrition as children who might have grown up in the poverty of the Victorian era. But others represented fields such as coal mining or shipbuilding, where men of small stature could offer unique value. Their unlikely champion was the Member of Parliament for the Birkenhead constituency, ironically, a six foot six man named Alfred Bigland. Bigland heard the story of the Durham miner and petitioned the War Department to allow him to raise a battalion of men below the height requirement. By the end of November, over 3,000 men between the heights of 5 foot and 5 foot 3 inches had enlisted in two battalions in Birkenhead, originally formed as the 1st and 2nd Birkenhead Battalions of the Cheshire Regiment. These battalions received the nickname Bantams. The name, originally derived from the city of Bantam, India, was popularly used to refer to miniature breeds of chickens, fowl that were one quarter or one fifth the size of a larger breed, but known for their scrappy character. The name had carried over to boxing, where the category of bantam weight, between 115 and 118 pounds, had produced several notable boxers. Men in the Birkenhead battalions were given an enamel badge with three Bs, meaning Biglands Birkenhead Bantams. The formation of the battalions was interesting. If the issue was that the men were as fit as any other, why wouldn't the War Office have simply lowered the height requirements? The fact is that in 1914, the War Office was already overwhelmed with recruits. In the first two months of the war, nearly three quarters of a million men enlisted, swamping the country's ability to outfit and train the new men. In September 1914, the Army had actually increased the height requirement to 5 foot 6 inches in order to further restrict the flow of new men. But the recruitment of separate Bantam battalions allowed them advantages. The initial inquiry by Bigland was answered by Sir Henry McKinnon, the general officer commanding the Western Division. His answer was that the War Office was interested in the idea, but too much press to undertake the formation of a new type of regiment. The War Office would provide weapons, but the Birkenhead Recruiting Committee would have to provide food, clothing, and lodging. Thus, the cost and part of the administration of the new regiments could be thrown over to the local counties. And as the regiments would receive local attention, they would also help raise funds to support the war. It is also possible that the War Office assumed that such soldiers brought together could form a common bond that would enhance unit cohesion, or some historians speculate the thinking might simply have been that the war would be won easily and quickly, and the new battalions would never be needed. In any case, the idea spread beyond the battalions in Bergenhead, which were renamed the 15th and 16th Battalions of the Cheshire Regiment. The Lancashire Fusiliers, the West Yorkshires, the Royal Scots, and the Highland Light Infantry all formed Bantam Battalions. Canada received permission to recruit Bantams in 1916, including the 143rd Overseas Battalion, recruited from British Columbia and popularly known as the BC Bantams. Eventually, there would be 29 battalions of Bantams formed, over 48,000 British and 2,000 Canadian troops. True to their name, the Bantams could be scrappy. The Bantams of the 18th Battalion of the Highland Light Infantry, based in Glasgow, were so known for brawling in pubs that locals referred to them as Devil Dwarves. Historian Sidney Allenson said of them, their quarrelsome reputation was legendary. If the idea at the War Office was that the extra battalions would not be needed, they were sorely wrong. The war became a harsh reality for the British Army, Bantams included. A shocking example is what happened to the Soles family of Great Risington. The family had five sons that a neighbor described as good-looking, but not very tall. 
Three of the five joined the 16th Cheshire's, original Bantams, while the two youngest joined a Worcestershire regiment. On July 19, 1916, Fred Soles went over the top with the 16th at the Bloody Battle of the Somme. He was never seen again. A day later, his brother Walter was wounded in the leg. He was taken to the hospital where he seemed to recover before dying suddenly of an embolism. Alf and Arthur Soles were identical twins, born within an hour of each other. They died within five days of each other, victims of a German offensive in 1918. The final brother, Albert, died in Flanders the same year. The stunning sacrifice of the Soles family was stark proof that Bantams could sacrifice as much as any other soldier. 921 officers and other ranks of the 15th and 16th Cheshires lost their lives in the Great War. Bantams did face specific issues in the field, from more difficulty in muddy trenches to trench steps too low for them to be able to look over the top. But what harmed them most was that they had a restricted supply of replacements. As the war took its toll, fewer and fewer fit Bantams could be found to replace losses, and recruiting for Bantams was more susceptible to recruits who were under age or in ill health. Many Bantams moved to other service, such as tunneling detachments or the tank corps, where their size was again an advantage. Conscription reduced the need for special recruiting. Heavy losses at the Battle of the Somme damaged morale. Slowly, the Bantam battalions mixed in regular recruits until their battalions lost their distinct nature. After the war, there was another scandal as these men who had served their country were then again found unfit to serve because of their height. For example, Bantams were considered to be too short to serve as mail sorters for the British Post Office. When the Postmaster General refused to relent, one disgusted member of Parliament noted that Napoleon Bonaparte would have been considered unfit to serve with the British Postal Service. In the end, the Bantam experience proved that the inch did not matter. Those troops were as easily trained and just as good a soldier as anyone else, and they fought in some of the most grueling battles of the Great War. Today, the British Army accepts recruits down to 4 foot 10 inches tall. Perhaps their service in the Great War is best described by a poem by an anonymous author at the time. Each one a pocket Hercules, five foot and a bit, a kind of bovril essence of six foot British grit. If you enjoyed this History Guy short, then feel free to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and check us out on Patreon, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and our merchandise on teespring.com.